Today, I'm with Jason Schneider, and I'm really excited to be talking with him uh, because he is a true expert at uh, NLP, but more than that, it's more like human potential. So we're going to, I think this is going to be an empowering call uh, or a meeting with Jason. So Jason, hi. Thanks for being here. Hey. Thanks for doing this. Thanks so much for having me again. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So there's so much I want to ask you about, but I want to start with your bio so that people kind of get a sense of your background. Um, so Jason, you've been training and coaching full time since 2010, uh, and you have facilitated training programs, um, all over the world, um, in person, <laughs> not just via zoom, but you've, you've been in person, uh, doing paid trainings in Canada, Africa, Finland, Norway, Indonesia, Australia, and of course, all over the U S um, you now do, you know, a lot of obviously online, uh, training programs and they're really experiential. They're focused on getting lasting results among the participants and helping them apply advanced coaching skills to shift uh, their, you know, their mindset and also the mindsets of, of their clients. Um, you are currently the president of the USA Institute on Neurosemantics, which is like a branch or uh, like an advanced version of NLP. Well, I'll have you explain that. Actually, maybe that's the first thing I want to ask you about. Um, most of the people watching this have heard of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which we're going to talk about. You have a different uh, way of talking about it than, than most people, but um, you really talk a lot about neurosemantics and not just NLP. So what is neurosemantics? How does it relate to NLP? That's a, that's a really good question and one that I, I have to deal with a lot because NLP is a broad field and not many people, well, a lot of people have a shallow understanding of it, not many people have dove too deep to really know the distinction. So when I think about neurosemantics, I think about it as a series of updates and add-ons on top of the traditional NLP uh, modality. So we've got a lot, and the main one is, which is really cool, actually, the main distinction uh, besides the fact that, that the community of neurosemantics focuses on professionalism and self-actualization as the application of NLP, so it's not so much focused on uh, influencing others, it's more about influencing yourself and uh, in order to be a better leader and to help people to unleash their highest potential. But one of the coolest things about neurosemantics is the focus on this thing called the meta-states model. And so it's about um, how our feelings about our feelings are so much more powerful than just our feelings about the world, or our thoughts about our thoughts are so much more powerful and influential than just our, our thoughts about the world. So that's well, kind of a simple big. distinction. Yeah, it's a really, I mean, I love how you said that. It's poetic, but there's a, and, and there's a lot behind it. I mean, it's something you can be pondering for years, right, and practicing uh, for, for a lifetime. So let's say that again. Your feelings, about your feelings are more important than th those feelings. So, so give us an example of this, right? Yeah, right. So like, um, well, I guess I could give, I, I think your audience might be able to relate. I think a lot of them will have tried affirmations in the past. Sure. And I don't sure. know have you, if you've ever tried affirmations. Yes, of course, of course. And so I think a lot of people have the, the experience that practice, I am uh, rich and abundant. And then the thought about that thought in the back of my mind is like, no, you're not. Right. <laughs> you yeah. have a thought right. about the right. thought that then kind of cancels it out. Right. And validates. Um, yes. Yes. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's just at that's the so primary level. And then, but, but even we can go beyond that. So we can say something like I'm rich and abundant. And then the voice in your head goes, no, you're not. And then the voice about that voice, voice goes, why are you judging yourself? And the Ooh. voice about that voice goes, you should know better. You're, you should be more evolved than that. Wow. And then you start to feel, so, so you start with this kind of uh, maybe, well, and this is an affirmation, but it happens all day long where you're stuck in traffic or, or, you know, something happens in the world, you get frustrated, then you get angry at yourself, get getting frustrated, and then you're ashamed of yourself for getting angry at yourself, for getting frustrated, and then you get pissed off at yourself for getting ashamed at yourself. For, and this kind of hall of mirrors goes on. And, and the interesting thing is that whatever is at the top of the chain here, and, and these examples are for like negative chains of thinking. Um, but what, uh, we could do this positively and, and for blessing ourselves and others as well. But whatever's at the top is kind of like the CEO of that thought chain. So think of it like a hierarchy, like an organizational hierarchy. Is whatever's at the top is going to uh, govern, organize, modulate, and control everything underneath it. So this is so, where it gets kind of important. Yeah, this is so interesting. So 
Yeah, I mean, you brilliantly talked about that chain that we've all experienced before. I feel like with the affirmations, uh, again, I, I'm not an expert on affirmations. Of course, I've read books that have talked about it. Uh, I've heard, you know, lots of interviews or whatever. It's almost like you have to like beat yourself into <laughs> with that primary thought. You just have to beat yourself. No, oh, no, no, I am abundant. No, no, I don't care what everyone says. I don't care what my mind says. Ah, la, 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 I'm abundant, I'm abundant, right? Like it's, it's, it's this kind of denial of any other thought other than that thought. So, but, so what you're saying is you don't have to deny. I mean, so what you've done already is you've brought awareness to that chain of thoughts. And then you're talking about this, this kind of top level thought or CEO thought. What is that? What's an example of a C, the top level thought and how do you? Yeah. 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 So, so like in the example of the affirmation that we're using here today, the top level thought, at least in the, so far as we've gone into the example, would be a, a, a thought and a feeling of kind of negation or doubt. So we feel doubt about this affirmation, this thing that we would like to believe, and that higher level doubt now cancels it out. Whereas you could have a, something, let's say, for example, that you don't want to believe about yourself, like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not good with money, or oh, I'm not a successful, I'm not good at being an entrepreneur. And then the thought of, above your head goes, yeah, that's right. You're totally not. Like, we all agree with that. <laughs> and so, like, that's, again, these are for the negative side of things. But, like, one example that I really love, um, because, because I think it's such a powerful state to have, is, uh, is acceptance especially with all the things that are going on right now with accelerated uh, change and transformation going on in the world and, and a lot of people looking at it as problems, but also being able to see the side of opportunities, that when stuff happens to us in the world, um, we can fight with it. That's one way to feel about it, or we can accept it. And so when people tend to fight with the things that are out of their power, that's other people, um, worldly situations, the economy, uh, politics, things that are, that are not directly in their power, then that can tend to lead to frustrations, which is okay. It's okay for people to get frustrated or angry about things that they don't like, but you, it's okay, but it's a lot you create a very big problem when you get upset at yourself or angry at yourself for being frustrated. So you're frustrated that the economy is not going the way you want it to. You're frustrated that your plans got disrupted because of, of changes in the political or, 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 or cultural environment. You're frustrated because something simple, like somebody cut you off in traffic or somebody uh, says something to you that you don't like. But as soon as you get mad at yourself for getting frustrated now, again, you've created a whole layer of problems, but you can always just accept that you're mad at yourself for getting frustrated. And that acts like this CEO where it's like, doo, 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 doo. the hall of mirrors kind of yeah. collapses. Yeah. And no matter how deep you've gotten yourself into this, um, this funk, this hole, right. this hall of mirrors of negativity, you can always just layer some acceptance on top. Nice. And all of a sudden it all, it's like cutting off the dragon at its head. Right. So it's pretty uh, an interesting practice. Yeah, that's really good. And speaking of all that's going on in the world, oh my gosh, economy, uh, politics, um, you know, uh, obviously public health. And I mean, so, you know, one's own career and job is, is like the transformation that's been overnight instant. Um, you talk about how, so help us deal with the problems of the world, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> You're right. The problems in our lives. Talk, <laughs> yeah, tell us about that. Let's, uh, we have all these problems. How do we deal with all these problems? Yeah, so problem, first of all, I think that neurolinguistic programming and especially neurosemantics as, as a field are really, um, if you think about it, tools for solving problems. They are problem solving tools um, and, or, or ways of looking at the world that are most conductive to solving your problems in a way that's like joyful to kind of model, model some things from you. You're, you're solving problems. That, now, a lot of people, they do not like problems. So there's a, there's a problem and they, 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 they bring this state of dislike or aversion to the problem. And one of the interesting things about problems is that problems are actually like, like what, one of the amazing beliefs of self-actualizing people, especially entrepreneurs, is that problems are the lifeblood of self-actualization and problems are the lifeblood of, of any entrepreneur's business. So any sort of problem, any entrepreneur kind of looks at that. If you're thinking about building wealth for yourself, any entrepreneur goes, ooh, there's something to be solved here. 
And so problems aren't actually a bad thing. Problems are actually uh, opportunities for us to get creative, to grow, um, and to think differently about things. They kind of push these external problems, not the internal problems that I'm angry at myself for being frustrated about them, but these external problems are really where our, our perception of the world, our model of the world is getting pushed up with the reality of the situation. And one of them needs to change and one of them is not going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is really good. So this, this idea of um, the problems being opportunities, right, is such a profound shift of definition uh, and, and just frame, way of looking at it that um, it's like when I look at, you know, well, I mean, actually similar to how people look at their to-do list, right? Like when we look at our to-do list, we could see this, oh my God, I got to get all these things done. It's like, oh, wow. These are the things that if I get done, moves my life forward. <laughs> you know, like, right. like, or I cannot do them and not move my life forward. That's okay too. <laughs> but it, so the problems are the same way. Problems are like, um, you know, especially problems that are in our control, right? Um, so let's talk, about, let, 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 let's talk about these two things. I want to talk about problems. I don't know which one we should start with. Problems that are in our control and problems that are out of our control. Um, there's so much of it these days, both, both ways. Um, let's start with, okay, let's start with problems that are not in our control. How, mm -hmm. do, we, how do we relate to that? How to relate to those? Right. I mean, yes, you could say, well, entrepreneurs think, oh, well, that's an opportunity to add value, to really bring some benefit into people's lives. But let's say it's out of our control. Let's say it's like politics. Let's say it's like, you know, people, you know, racial injustice. I mean, I'm, you know, racial, systemic racial injustice. <laughs> right. One person, you know, like, or, or climate change. I mean, these problems that are, yeah, sure, I'll shower less or turn off the lights, but climate change or racial injustice, you know, like how, how, how do we relate to those problems? Well, I, I think obviously I don't, I don't know if we're going to solve all the world's problems <laughs> in this brief interview today, but, but just like for the first thing that comes to mind, first of all, is again, there's this distinction between problems that are directly in your control and there are problems that are out of your direct control and potentially in your realm of influence. And so I think that's a good distinction is, is, is it, is it a, a problem that's, basically behind my nose and toes, <laughs> or is it on the other side of that? And, and to make that distinction is a very, a very useful one. Now, the first thing I'll say about problems that are, we'll start with outside of you, is really a strong, 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 being able to have in yourself the ability to, to practice, develop a practice of acceptance. So, you know, when we were talking earlier, I was writing with you and I was saying that there's some categories of, of problems that are never really the problem, which is an interesting thing. So, for example, the world outside of you is never, never, never really the problem. The world cannot be the See, a problem. You ever walk outside? Don't you hate it when you walk outside and you trip over a problem? It doesn't happen because problems are a human construct. The earth doesn't care if there's global warming or not. It's gonna sort it out, it's not a problem. The universe is gonna sort it out. It's a problem for you maybe in your little subjective experience. And so problems aren't outside things, first of all, problems are inside things. So the world is never a problem because the world would be just fine if you don't think of that thing as a problem without you. So the world isn't the problem. Now, other people are outside of you. They're never the problem either. So that's kind of good news because that's outside of you. It's outside of your realm of control. So the world's never the problem. Other people are never the problem. Another really cool thing is that you are never the problem. And this goes for everybody all the time. And this is kind of another one of those kind of like profound uh, understandings when you get it in you is that you are never the problem because you've done things in the past that are per perhaps problematic and yet you're still here. And you could do things differently in the future. You can learn from those mistakes. You can learn from those, those situations and, and grow beyond them, like I'm sure most people have done things in the past that they go, ooh, I would never do that again. Um, and so you're never the problem. And another interesting thing is that the past is never the problem. A lot of times people have bad relationship with the past. But, but just to summarize here, um, because the past is over with. If you have a problem with the past, it's not the past that you have a problem with. It's your memory. <laughs> That's in you right here, right now causing a, a potential problem yeah. within you. And that's interesting because one of the key, well, I mean, 
neuro uh, NLP neurosemantics. I like that you said it's it's not about it's about influencing you essentially. It's like influence like using the tools to influence yourself first, so that you can be more effective doing whatever it is, whether you're influencing others or not. But um, so let's talk about that. Like like. Those of us who are bothered by our past, how does NLP or neurosemantics help with that? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things is, again, it's not the past that's bothering you. So these linguistic, these fine linguistic distinctions are, are, are one of the ways that we can get more, more sane is the word that we would use in neurosemantics, not as a, compared to insane, but as compared to unsane. <laughs> and so, so, you know, we can be sane and we can be unsane. doesn't mean we're insane. It just means that, that unsane just means that the way we're thinking about the world is not aligned with the way the world really is. It's not accurate to the structure of the world. So, so memories are never really the, the, what happened in the past is never the, really the problem. The problem is how are you thinking about it right now? And how is that holding you back and preventing you from getting to where you want to be? Because there's many memories that you could have within yourself or that someone can have within them where, where you remember something that was problematic in a way that you use it to grow and to prepare and to, to become more resourceful to handle the things that are coming at you in the future. So uh, like, in, in, like in a short sentence, it's not the memories, it's not the past that's the problem. It's not even the memory that's the problem. It's how are you thinking about that memory and how are you using it? Yeah. So finding new and better ways to use your memories. Uh, one, one simple example of that, um, we may have talked about this on a previous call, is when you remember your memories, you remember them one of two ways. Did you, did you know that, George, that you remember your memories one of two ways? And there's basically only two ways. Um, and not all memories will be all the same, but one of these two, each of your memories is encoded one of the two. One of the ways to encode our memories is step into them kind of like we're reliving them. So if you took a moment and you thought of like a positive memory from the past, um, it's encoded one of these two ways. Either you're stepped in it and you kind of regress back into your younger self. You see what you saw in that moment through your eyes. You hear what you hear. You feel what you felt. And you feel those feelings. And another way to remember them is in third person, kind of stepped out. So you see younger you having that experience. So one great way to have a better relationship with our memories, especially the bad ones, is to kind of step outside of them and give ourselves some distance from them so that we don't kind of re-experience the emotions of the past again. But we can kind of step back, look at it from a perspective of resourcefulness and calmness so that we can learn from them. So, that, so we can think about the same memory from a different vantage point, a different point of view, a different perspective, and, and use it as a resource as opposed to it's bad enough that you had to go through the crap the first time. It's, it's, uh, it's not necessary to keep on reliving it over and over again in your neurology. Wow, that's really good. And that's, that's a really powerful example of one of the many tools that right. you know, linguistics programming and neurosemantics provides is, is how, do we, how do we use our memory, how do we use our thoughts in a way that's more constructive. And so now we can move forward better. Okay, so there's still so much more. I, I want to I get to this one for sure. This idea that, um, uh, you know, this is something you say, and I want you to talk about this. In order to get what you want, there are things you need to do, right? right. And the trick is to want to do the things you need to do to get what you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, so talk, right. about, talk about that. Un unpack that for us <laughs> Right. Well, I think especially in terms of like visualization. So a lot of a lot of coaches and nothing against them. Again, the problem is never the person. And I just want to like finish that that quote, because the problem is never the world. The problem is never other people. The problem is never you. And the problem is never the past. The problem is always your frame of mind. And the good thing is that if I had that frame of mind or someone else had that frame of mind, they'd have the same problem as you. Because, again, the problem isn't the stuff. It's how you're looking at it. So one of the things that I see a lot of coaches saying is to visualize the end goal, like step in and visualize the end goal and be there and enjoy it and, and practice that. And so, and, and, and for most people, that's going to be really easy because the end goal is such an amazing, good feeling. Like you're there. I got it. Like it's phenomenal to just like have that. But the thing is, if you kind of get lost in that feeling and you're stepped into it, like stepped out versus and you're stepped into it, well, one of the things is, well, I don't have to do any work to get those feelings because that's the inside stuff. That's not that's outside really stuff. Yeah. And so, 
I think it's useful as a motivator uh, and it's important as a, a human being who's creating their life and living intentionally to know where you're headed and to be clear what that looks like. Um, however, in order to get there, there's the things you need to do to get there. And actually, this is something that, that I really have refined this, this thought from, from uh, my, my work with you, which is, so in order to get there, you need to do some things in order to get there. And when, when we think about the things we need to do to get there, typically that imagination is like, ah, like we get in and we have the six pack abs and you're like, oh yeah, this is great. But then you're like, oh, I'm going to the gym, doing sit ups, like, so all these little steps along the way that we need to do, and we, whenever we imagine them, we come along with these bad feelings. Well, it's no wonder that you don't take action towards your goals or that you don't move forward or you kind of put goals aside that maybe you did want, but you go, oh, it's too hard or nah, it's not really for me or I don't think I could ever get it. And so the trick is really to take that, a state of joy and to bring it to the actions that you need to do in order to get what you want and spend the majority of your time visualizing yourself, not visualizing yourself, it's not visualizing yourself, but it's uh, stepping into those memories and practicing the visualization of being inside those memories, looking through your eyes, uh, seeing what you see, hearing what you hear, feeling what you feel, smelling what you smell, tasting what you taste, uh, as you eat the spinach, as opposed to eating the, you know, <laughs> as opposed to the joy of having the, uh, the six pack abs. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really, that's really good. It's really true. It's like, it's like people can fantasize and, and then still sit on the couch and eat potato chips while they're fantasizing <laughs> about the six, you know, the apps versus, versus feeling the goodness. Like, Oh, it feels so good to work out or to, to, to remember like what parts of it felt good and then kind of like, I don't know. Emphasize and also I think last thing on that one, I think that a lot of times people aren't clear on what they need to do to get what they want. So they have this vision and, and the bigger the goal, the bigger the dream, the bigger the want, or the further you are away from it, the more that needs to get done and the longer it's going to take most likely. And so a lot of people, especially when they pick a big one and they're starting out from a beginner's mind, they don't know what these things are. And so that's where it becomes important to flush out what the things are that you need to do to get what you want, maybe model some experts um, and or read some books or do some research on the internet or ask them questions to your friends who've accomplished it or reflect back on your past when you've done it before, figure out what those things are. And, and that will help you to find the things that you can practice enjoying on the way to getting what you want and getting that kind of that meta joy, because th this is the last bit on that one also is that, that when you visualize these big things, there's no guarantees in life. So people visualize what they want and these dreams and these goals, and if the practice of getting there is not enjoyable, then, then not only are you not guaranteed that you'll get it, but you won't enjoy the process. So when you practice enjoying the process, not only does it increase the probability that you'll get the goal, but it makes it a lot less important whether you do or not. Wow. Yeah. So good. So we have a few minutes left and I want to make sure people know how they can kind of well, step into working with you because you have a couple ways. You've got um, self-study courses online so people can just down, you know, access them anytime. Uh, second, you have live events uh, online so people can kind of check their schedule and, and join you. And then you also do um, work with clients, individual clients. Um, oh, and you also, no, I'm sorry, you have a, you have a mentoring program, actually a group, a group program. So maybe tell us about, okay, let's start with the, let's start with the, um, let's start with the group program, actually. What, what, what kind of person is right for your group program uh, that should, you know, look at this? Yeah, so the group program is great for anybody who is in personal development, um, whether it's really about coaching yourself or you're coaching other people using whatever modality it is. It's not just for NLP coaches, but it's about people who are, again, either interested in coaching themselves or you already have a practice and you're coaching others and you want to refine your skills, refine your tools, um, and maybe add some other skills and tools to your toolbox to get better results. So we do in that group program um, live events. We have um, we have actual uh, practice sessions that are dedicated to practicing skills because the practice is so much more important than the the head knowledge and opportunity to interact with me and get your questions answered. It's really key what you just said. Practice sessions. Practice is more important than just head knowledge because, of course, if we have the head knowledge but we haven't integrated it into our everyday use. Uh, make it more instinctual, then we're not getting the real benefit of it, right? So that's really cool that your group mentoring program has those practice sessions 
built in so that they're actually growing, they're actually changing, trans transforming into higher potential. Um, you have live events uh, coming up. Do you want to mention any of them? And I know people might be watching this uh, months later, but um, but I'll, I'll definitely have the link uh, for people to go. But give me a sense of what your what a typical live event is like. Yeah, sure. So the live events now are ninety minutes long, and they 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 basically start out with right now. It's going to be changing in 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 the following year, but for the next five months, for the rest of the this year, each one of those events is focusing on one foundational skill of NLP that's applied to coaching, communication, and leadership. So the next one we have coming up is on state management. We talked a bit today in concept about accepting things better, uh, bringing joy to things. And so that one, we're really going to hone in on the practice of how to do that with yourself and with other people. And then there's always time after. So we leave an extra half an hour in the room for people to want to hang around, network, meet each other, and actually practice the skills to actually get hands-on practice doing the actual exercises. So it's very practical, very experiential. Uh, attending the workshops, you experience it firsthand, and also you learn the step-by-step -step procedures and you have opportunity to practice it with other people. So right now we're doing three a month uh, events like that, um, where there's opportunities every uh, three Wednesdays of the month, the first, third, and fourth Wednesday of the month to focus in and practice a specific skill. And these are all online, right? So yeah. people can join from anywhere in the world. Um, and then you have your do-it-yourself courses that people can go and just you know sign up and download and kind of get into it. And I, I, you want to say anything about those? Well, those are great. I mean, those basically right now, uh, in all transparency, we're taking these live events that we're doing uh, for the people who show up live and we're converting those into online courses. Yeah. So they're the same events that you would go to live. If you can't make it live, you can get the online course. And then typically the online courses are valuable because um, they're broken down bit by bit uh, into like manageable chunks. So it's not a 90 minute or two hour thing or short four minute bits, uh, topical, and then some added in practice exercises and skill builders that people can uh, go and play with their friends and their family or their clients and actually have skill builders to implement again. Awesome. Awesome. Your website is perception Academy, perception academy.com. Of course, I will have all the links in the notes of the video. Jason, thank you so much for uh, today, for your, the work that you do for people. And um, I'm excited for people to kind of get to know your work better. So thanks for all you do. Thank you so much, George.